Disney nerds, what's up? Today I want to talk about a little bit of a difficult topic that has been on my mind a lot over the years, but has come more to the forefront recently after my more recent video on the Game of Thrones. And this is how we frame violence against women in our fantasy books based on the idea that most of our high fantasy novels are sort of based on medieval Europe. More specifically, it's how the argument it's historical is sort of used as a blanket argument against any criticism or dialogue about these books and how they deal with sexism and violence against women. Now, of course, this is a very nuanced discussion and unfortunately on the internet, we're not very good at having nuanced discussions. So today we're going to try to cover this very carefully and really talk about it from multiple sides. One thing I want to talk about is that A Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire by George R.R. R. Martin has sort of become a lightning rod for all of these sorts of discussions and criticisms. And that just naturally happens because Game of Thrones became such a sensation because it is the most famous and the most popular of these things. That's just kind of what happens. It reminds me a lot of how Harry Potter has somehow become the central point of all things wrong with 90s kid lit, or a lot of things that are directed at Harry Potter are seen in many, many books. So while today I will be using Game of Thrones as an example because it is the most famous, popular, easiest to discuss going forward, I don't want this to be an idea that somehow Martin caused these problems or Martin's the worst one at this because neither of those are true. My usage of Game of Thrones in this video is not a pile on, hardly. You guys know I loved the first book. It is more of a way for me to relate to more people as it's a very easy reference point. So today we're gonna talk about actual history. What is historical for medieval Europe in that time period? We are going to discuss how it's historical is a great argument for some criticisms, but not all. We're gonna talk about why women may feel uncomfortable reading these things or may avoid books with these things in it, even if it's real history. And finally kind of end on a discussion of the future of our genre and what this means for it. As always, I welcome disagreement, pushback, arguments against the arguments I put in this video, but I am always polite to you guys even when you disagree and I expect that same politeness in return. Additionally, and very importantly, I have only read the first book of A Song of Ice and Fire, A Game of Thrones, so please, please, I'm begging you, do not spoil things in the comments. I know there are probably scenes from other books you'd like to talk about, but please talk about them in the vaguest of terms so that I am personally not spoiled. With that being said, I'll see you after the jump. Of course, we are going to start with the history. As notably, most of the fantasy that gets this argument is set in medieval Europe. That's the history we'll be focusing on today. Interestingly, due to pop culture, medieval as a term not only denotes a certain time period, but also certain attitudes, especially ones of cruelty or violence. It feels like the two are intrinsically linked in our minds. First, let's cover arranged marriages and girls getting married very young. Now, this is pretty hard research to do because unfortunately records just weren't kept very well the further you go back. So we don't always have the most reliable information to work off of. But researchers have found clues to sort of piece things together. And one of the most important things we need to talk about is that not all marriages in medieval Europe were created the same. It depended on several factors, mostly talking about your social rank, your economic status, and of course, geographical location. So when we kind of make blanket statements, that's usually incorrect. Let's first talk about marriages within rural communities. There actually isn't much evidence that girls got married much younger than boys. Rather, they both probably married in their teens. And widows to widower numbers are similar enough in a way to point to the fact that men and women were probably most likely marrying at similar ages. While these ages were younger than we think of now, historians suggest youthful marriages often happened between 14 and 18. Although, as we know that life expectancies in the Middle Ages were lower, so this probably doesn't come as a big surprise. Boys and girls were both considered ready for marriage when they hit puberty. And since puberty came slightly earlier for girls than boys, they probably did marry slightly younger, but still at comparable times. And although it's difficult to tell, it does seem that grooms started getting married later as the Middle Ages went on. 
although historians aren't sure if that's because it was simply more likely for men to remarry after becoming a widower, and records didn't always denote whether a marriage was the first or second one. It's actually the structure of aristocratic marriages that I feel we are most familiar with and we see the most as represented in fantasy. Because heirs were extremely important, it means that aristocratic women were extremely tied to the success or longevity of a house. As family honor was tied into this, chastity and virginity became more and more important, thus a chance that aristocratic women would be married vastly younger to avoid compromises in the forms of sexual impurity. And as heirs were often strategical in joining lineages, this is also where vast differences in ages of the bride and groom were more likely to be seen. Let's move on to another crux of fantasy violence against women, which is sexual violence. Now, moving forward, I am just going to use the term violence to make YouTube happy, but know that this is what we are talking about. First, yes, this type of violence was probably very prevalent in the Middle Ages, although I'm not sure it was much more prevalent than it is now, but we'll get there later. However, it's really incorrect to assume that women were completely helpless and incapable of justice on their own behalves. In fact, we have many records from court cases that show that women often accused their abusers on their own. They didn't need someone else to do it for them. They stepped forward. It's also important to note that Violence against women in this manner was considered abhorrent. There were laws against it. You weren't allowed to just go and do it and no one would care. Like, even though it happened probably frequently, it wasn't like it was some sort of free for all where people didn't think it was bad. No, there were laws against it. Also, you have to remember that women were a part of communities and communities often wouldn't take these kind of offenses lying down. Of course, that isn't to say things are somehow great for women or how they were now. Obviously, reading these cases are very disturbing, and so many of them were dismissed for the silliest reasons, like when a very, very young girl got attacked, and the whole case was dismissed because she accidentally said it happened on a different day than it actually did. And obviously, all of these things were lumped in as property damage because women were considered property, so also not great. Things weren't great, but things weren't like as a free-for-all, I think, as somehow we imagine it. Of course, sexual violence and wartime indeed happened and was unfortunately very prevalent. Women and children were seen as property and were seen as things to rightfully take when a city or a town or something was conquered. The stark reality of this that is often presented in fantasy is unfortunately historically accurate. These things did happen. Now, I will say that one thing that is often overlooked or ignored in fantasy is that these stark realities of wartime were often happening to men and boys as well. We focus so much on women and girls that we don't realize that all children in these historical accounts is, is gender neutral and that it was probably happening to boys and there is evidence that it was also happening to men. And finally, I think it's important to bring up a few myths that we have about the Middle Ages that historians have proven to be inaccurate, two of the most common ones being chastity belts and prima nocta as immortalized in the 1995 film Braveheart. Both of these have been debunked as not happening in the Middle Ages, yet are still very much perpetuated in a lot of different kinds of media today. Now that we have that brief overview of history under our belts, let's kind of talk about two main takeaways I personally have from it, which the first one let's focus on is the idea of how we use the argument it's historical in our fantasy discussions. I think an easy place to start with this discussion is to talk about my Game of Thrones review I did recently. Now, in case you missed it and you didn't watch that video, I loved this book, but there were a few things I wanted to discuss based on violence against women in the book. Specifically, I talked about Danny's storyline, which involves a very young girl of 13 being in an arranged marriage with someone around 30. I actually had no problem with that storyline itself. I found it an intriguing storyline and one that made sense, particularly in the context of Danny's history and family. My large problems with Danny's story was actually the language that was used surrounding how her body was described and certain events in the book were described, not the events themselves. And if you'll notice, those things really have nothing to do with the whole historical nature of her story. It is, is much more to do with the writing of it. Yet so many comments, I'd say the vast majority of comments commenting on that specific part of the video came with me with like historical data and facts about how Danny could be married at 13, even though that wasn't the problem I had with the story at all. 
Now, there were some commenters who wanted to push back against what I said, and they talked about the writing and narrative themselves. So I do wanna recognize those. Those were great comments, and they did help me see things in a little bit of a different light. But I wanna highlight that how saying it's historical really didn't address my concerns about the language used on Danny. And I think this is a great representation of a larger problem persisting in these type of discussions on the internet, is that when women come forward with these things, they are often talking about how something is presented or framed rather than arguing against the fact that these historical things did happen in the past. It is not somehow that women are removed from the struggles that women had historically, far from it. We'll talk about that later. It is more that we tend to take issues with how or why the events are portrayed the way they are and not a denial that they ever happened. So in those cases, no. It's historical is not a valid argument against these criticisms because that is not what these criticisms are about. The criticisms are about the how of the story, not the what. To get more specific, for me with Danny's storyline in particular, I had a lot more of a problem with the language used surrounding Danny's body and how Danny and Drago's first night was portrayed. There were some good arguments about how this is framed from Danny's perspective. And so that's why it might be off. And I did appreciate those comments, but I still think the narrative could have done a little more to present this in a different light occasionally. So we had some pushback against Danny's perspective. I unfortunately can't be more specific like reading passages because YouTube will get angry at me and I do kind of try to keep this family friendly. But in the description box below, I will put chapters and attempt page numbers. So if you wanna see some of the language I'm talking about, you can go check it out for yourself. Another thing that women often take issue with in these narratives that cannot be answered by its historical is how sometimes violence against women is used as the only possible worst thing that could ever happen to a woman. Sometimes we say it's lazy writing because we truly believe it. It's not that the events couldn't happen. It's not that they couldn't happen historically. That's not what's being argued. What's being argued is the prevalence of these storylines as ways to punish their female characters as if it's the only possible bad thing or the only thing that could push a female character to do anything. It can often feel repetitive and lazy as if the author couldn't think possibly of another traumatic incidents to happen to a woman to make her feel that way that's comparable. It's almost as if they think that kind of trauma has to be a universal experience, that every female who lived in the Middle Ages went through this experience. And the historical data just, it doesn't support that. You'll also notice something really important. At the end of the previous section, I talked about how historically, this type of violence was indeed happening to boys and men. And yet, when I read high fantasy novels, this is almost never, if ever, honestly, I can't think of a single example where this type of violence is perpetuated against men and boys. And so sometimes I do have to ask the question, why do we so perpetuate this sort of violence against women and ignore the technically very real historical evidence that this was also happening to men and boys? This leads us naturally into the second important point to discuss with this, which is some reasons why women may not want to read these storylines, even if they are technically accurate and they're completely historical and they have a total reason to be in the narrative. And there are honestly many valid reasons for this, but one of the ones I find the most compelling personally is the idea that we frame these stories as that's how it used to be. That's just how it was. When the reality for many women is that not really much has changed. And it's not just how it was, but how it often still is. While researching these videos, I couldn't help but get this really eerie sense of familiarity when reading these court cases of how these women who lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago were fighting their cases and the responses to them. The uphill battles they fought, how people didn't believe them, the small to non-existent punishments for their abusers. It rang really true to today. Take this example, the case of a 30 year old woman named Joan who accused a man in 1313. She became pregnant from this attack. The jury's decision was to exonerate the accused man because quote, a child could not be engendered without consent of both parties. You may want to laugh at that until you remember in the not very distant past of 2012, a candidate for the US Senate named Todd Akin said in reference to pregnancy resulting from violent attack, 
First of all, from what I understand from doctors, that is really rare. If it is legitimate assault, the female body has ways to try and shut down that whole thing. We may shake our heads at the five pound punishment, roughly 3,000 American dollars today, that were inflicted on some of these men who destroyed these women's lives back in the Middle Ages until we remember the endless amount of assaulters I could list here that got off either scot-free or with extremely mild punishment. I found a quote that I just love. Someone much smarter than me put it so eloquently. Now, before I read this quote, I want to remind you again, Game of Thrones has become a lightning rods for these things. This person does talk about Game of Thrones in this quote. Don't get distracted by it. Understand that I'm not trying to attack Game of Thrones, but she has some very good things to say. She said, Medieval stories are filled with violence, but the forms of violence that occur in them are particular to the times and cultures that produce them. Pointing this out isn't to dismiss them as relics of the past or to excuse these forms of violence as simply typical of the time, but it is instead to draw attention to the fact that the patriarchal violence of early historical references are manifestations of specific cultural ideologies. This matters because when we return to our modern stories of medieval violence, we see that they too represent specific and contemporary ideologies, not medieval ones. I would go so far as to argue that the forms of violence typically embraced as the most medieval are, in fact, quintessentially modern. When Game of Thrones shines a light on sexual violence from that time, it's claiming to show the patriarchal violence hidden in history, but the violence it shows reads less as revelatory, as if somehow people, women, do not know the horrific and continuing prevalence of sexual violence, and more as entertainment, a modern patriarchal violence itself that delights in reenacting that violence again and again. The common thread here is the medieval because it provides a convenient smokescreen, a way to distance ourselves from our own particular forms of fascist, racist, and sexual violence. The reality is though, that to understand what is medieval about particular forms of contemporary violence is not to understand a history of violence. It is instead to understand our own modern cruelty and our own deep discomfort with acknowledging it as ours. This, I think, is sometimes what is missing from these discussions about historical violence against women in these fantasy books. Sometimes women don't want to read these books not because we are removed from reality or removed from historical reality, but it's because we are all too aware of reality. We are all too aware, aware of the reality that we still face every day. And sometimes reading about those things can just be exhausting even if we know and accept that historically it's perfectly accurate and perfectly okay in these novels. So sometimes when a woman reader expresses that she does not want to read these things in a novel or doesn't want to read a novel because it focuses on these things, it is not some objective or moral judgment on the work itself. It is not proclaiming the work as good or bad. Instead, it is a subjective opinion based on the woman's own desires to decide what she does or doesn't want to read. And those sort of things should not be answered with it's historical because that's not what it's about. It's not about whether it's true or not. It's a whether or not I just personally want to read it. And look again, I loved A Game of Thrones. It was a fantastic book, but I still wanted to talk about these issues. And I was surprised sometimes by the vitriol I received as if I somehow hated this book. Absolutely not. You know, we can both love something and critically analyze it and ask ourselves questions about why things are included. They're not at odds with each other. It's okay to talk and criticize and discuss things that we love. It doesn't mean they're bad. So let's talk about the future of fantasy with what we've talked about today. What are the learning? What, what did we learn? What, are, what How do we move forward? How are we going to talk about and discuss and move forward with these often conflicting ideas? This is where we totally get into subjective opinion. This is just my, my opinion, but I have come up with about four ideas that I think we can think about as we move forward. First, I just like to ask authors to be intentional about these type of storylines. I'm not asking or expecting these storylines to go away at all. I'm asking to not make it an auto default and think about the repercussions of it on your world and story. Second, I'd ask authors to think about how they represent these storylines. Unsurprisingly, I find female authors do this usually better. Not always, but usually. So look to their fantasy books and how they portray these issues. 
To call out a male author I always call out as doing this particularly well, I would say look to Joe Abercrombie and The First Law. I will never stop being impressed that in 10 books, I think there are only three instances of that type of assault that I can think of. And most notably, despite the fact that Abercrombie does not shy away from a spicy scene, he has never written a graphic assault scene. They are 100% all fade to black or just mentioned as something that happened in the past. And they are always taken seriously. This is an extremely simple choice that Abercrombie made, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that allows him to use these storylines without feeling like he is glorifying them or fetishizing them in some way. Additionally, also remember that when you're using storylines about violence against women, to think about the woman's side in all of this and not just the male's perspective. Looking and understanding how a female might feel about it, the female perspective, even if that character is not a viewpoint and never will be in your novel, may give it a richness and carefulness that will deepen your story. Third, I'd ask fandoms and just commenters in general, like you and me, to be a little more discerning on where we use the it's historical argument. There will be many complaints in which talking about history is absolutely valid and appropriate. There will also be arguments, like many I've listed above, where it's just not. Let's remember that criticism against our favorite things does not make them bad or unlikable and are not attacks personally on us who love the work. Fourth, I'd love us all to remember that these books are works of fantasy. That means we have the unique opportunity to tell stories in exactly the way we want to, which means we can be as careful and nuanced as we want with these types of stories. This is a really complicated topic and I've tried to do it justice, although I am sure I have missed a lot of things as always is the case in these type of videos. I would really love to hear your thoughts on this. I do wanna hear all of those opinions, arguments, agreements, disagreements below. Let's keep the conversation going. Let's keep it nuanced. Let's keep it nice and friendly because it's important to talk about these difficult topics. As always, if you like these kind of deep dive videos, please like and subscribe. That is the best way to support me. And if you want to see what I'm currently reading as well as other nerdy rants, you can check me out on Instagram at bookborn.reviews. I'll see you next time. Bye.